Today on the Snap Covenant. The problem that Lawrence and Willem both have, that neither one sees as a problem, is that they are looking at this link between parent and child, and they're looking upon it as something that is almost entirely a biological or like scientific problem to be solved. What basically happens with both of them is that like they encounter this bond between parent and child, and their response to that is rather than attempts to understand the bond between parent and child, they cut the parent and child apart and sort of start like measuring them and studying them to figure out where the bond actually is. And in truth, like it's just the bond between them. And the way that we ascend at the end of it is that, like, we have used these cord items to have made that connection to all of these great ones. And in doing that, like, we've sort of achieved enlightenment. Please like, subscribe, and comment so that the algorithm gives this video a little boost, so that this video may appear to people who are not already following our Soulsborne content. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Sophie. Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Snack Covenant, episode 326. And today, we're talking about Lawrence. The worst vicar. So, Sophie. Yes, Sin. For anyone who's new to the podcast and may not have listened to our previous 700 episodes about Bloodborne, can you just tell me in a very TLDR way, what is a Lawrence? Well, Sim, a Lawrence is the first vicar, by which they mean founder, of the Yarnum Healing Church. And he's a character who is kind of never directly encountered. Uh, You find his skull, you see into his memories... You encounter a weird, like, nightmare version of him where he's on fire, and then you find a second skull of Lawrence. Depending on uh, how you interpret a certain boss, uh, there may be a third skull. (laughs) So he's a bit confusing. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sin. Let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about where Lawrence is from. Unfortunately, in-game... Oh my god, kitten. Hi, hi, Ingrid. Everybody say hi to Ingrid. She's so cute. So, unfortunately, in-game, we don't really get information on where he's from. We get information about where he's not from. He's not from Yarnum. What makes you say that? Because he has to go there from somewhere else. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Sophie. So could it have been a situation where he... Started his life in Yarnum, moved around, and then came back to Yarnum? I think we're getting into the realm of, like, very fanficy there. (laughs) Um, The whole deal with Lawrence and Bergenworth is that they're an institution that don't initially know very much about Yarnum, and they seek to investigate it. Lawrence being from outside Yarnum is, like, very key to who he is and why he goes there. You know, in the beginning of the game... And I love Bloodborne so much because the first time you play it, there's so many little things that you don't notice. Or because when we first played the game, it was so hard, you forgot a lot of things in the beginning. And I remember listening to something I think Redgrave was saying. And Redgrave was like, by the way, did everyone remember that at the start of the game, you actually have like lore in terms of who your character is and where they come from? Yeah, yeah. And I remember having my mind blown because I completely forgot. Could Lawrence be one of those starting characters? Could that shed some light into where he's from? Well, he'd be, there's one that's called Specialist that just mentions like an academician who does sleuthing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so he's he's not on my girls. All right. Okay, thank you, Sophie. And I actually want to ask you another thing. Certainly. So you know how movies, for example, have deleted scenes. Movies, for example. (laughs) 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 <laughs> for example, this entire medium. <laughs> so, movies have deleted scenes, right? Yes, yes. And Bloodborne has something similar going on, where it has certain content that may have been deleted, but can still shed some light on the on the lore in some way. Yeah, but it can also massively confuse things. 
So it depends on what exactly you're talking about. So at some point in the game, there was a Lawrence. Yes. In the cut content type. Yes, title. this was very confusing when we found it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about it? All right. So as someone who's been pretty involved in the sort of data mining aspect of like taking Bloodborne apart, something that happened very early on in that process was we found a whole lot of messages, like text files in the game, that were character dialogue. And they kept mentioning a guy called Lawrence. And they kept saying, Lawrence is this way. Are you looking for Lawrence? And it was like, oh, that's interesting. Because in the game that we have now, like Lawrence is sort of a key background figure, but you're not really looking for Lawrence. He's just sort of in the world. He's responsible for what happens, but he's not really directly involved anymore because he's been dead for so long. Ah, yes, Lawrence. Another outsider like yourself. Yeah, I know him. He left for the cathedral in the Eastern Quarter, on my advice even, and lucky for him. <laughs> you see, just after he left, the bell tolled, kicking off the hunt, and no offcomer ever lived through the hunt, trust me, mate. <laughs> One of the things you do in the game is you find Lawrence's skull. It's a pretty significant part of the game. So yeah. the idea of like Lawrence being someone saying, oh yeah, I saw Lawrence, he came by here earlier, is a bit, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it turned out that in an earlier draft of the story, you would have come to Yarnum with a friend of yours whose name was Lawrence. The plot of the game, like the thing driving you, rather than being the sort of like seek pale blood note and then you get thrown into the street and figure out the rest out for yourself, you would have been trying to find this Lawrence character. So that's where all the like, where is Lawrence? I'm looking for Lawrence. And people replying, Lawrence was came by here earlier. Oh, Lawrence was looking for you. A lot of the characters in earlier versions of the story did have their names recycled for things in the current game. That's something that took us a while to sort of like actually sort out what is a reference to the character we have now <laughs> and what is a reference to something from an older draft. So like if you look at like the Beast Roar, it mentions a character called Irreverent Izzy. Not Irreverent Izzy, but there was a character called Izzy in an older version who was kind of like the German figure. Who would, he was like a character, he was weirdly seemed to be in the hunter's dream rather than in the, the waking world. And he was the one who gave like the info dumps about like Ludwig and the history of the church and where the, the valley hamlet is and everything like that. Okay. Um, and yeah, he and there was another character who was presumably just the first hunter. And it looks like they made German by sort of mashing those two people together into one. Thank you, Sophie. So, Lawrence. At some point in his life, he goes to Bergenworth. Just a quick TLDR. What is that? Bergenworth is, they just call it a place of learning. So if we looked at it, we would think, oh, it's a university because it has like lecture halls. It has like the, led by a guy who's called the Provost. It has like all these library books everywhere. It's full of all these scholars. But at the same time, they are very into mysticism. And um, it's an, an older kind of like, approach to knowledge where instead of hyper focusing on one thing which is what you do now you try to have a, a wider education and just like the sciences so the bergenworth people like they are very versed in like history they do archaeology but they also do anatomy and they do like mind expansion sort of meditation stuff Mm -hmm. And they do, like, study the moon and study the stars and everything. So they're just sort of like these, um, just obsessed with knowledge as an entity in itself rather than having a field. That sounds very interesting. I feel like that's a school I would actually like to go to. Well, that's kind of how universities used to be. Because there was just, like, the sciences. And then over time, you gradually specialized sort of in, like, one thing. I had a flashback to when I went to university. Despite... Me having a Bachelor of Art, I majored in psychology, and everyone I've ever known were under the impression that I'd be taking, like, courses such as, like, Freud, history of psychology, yeah, yeah. things like that. And, you yeah. know, when you meet people, they'd feel like, ah, can you analyze me? And uh, the reality is, like, well, actually, I had to take uh, biology, neuroscience, mm. stats mm. one, stats yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would have preferred it at Bergenworth, because... Uh, that was not an enjoyable time in my life. No, well, Bergenworth looks like it's really fun. Now, Sophie. Yes, then. 
when Lawrence was studying in Bergenworth, yeah, he was studying uh, all the things you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Well, okay. We don't we don't know for certain if Lawrence was studying there or he was like in a senior position there. We know he is below the guy that ran Bergenworth. He's below like the provost of Bergenworth. How far below exactly is sort of like a question that's never really explained. I think he was probably like basically one of the people who worked directly under the provost rather than being Mm -hmm. a student there. Um, We'll get into that later on, but basically the, the impression that sort of forms is that like Lawrence left and took students with him who sort of followed him. So you get the impression like Lawrence was like part of like a breakaway sect sort of, and he was, he was maybe like running the place. Um, So there's a statue that we find much later in the game that's like never explicitly said to be Lawrence, but I think it pretty clearly is Lawrence. And they're dressed in this sort of very like ornate looking robe with this headpiece, this sort of like weird sort of long mask thing. (laughs) And it looks a lot like what Master Willem of Bergenworth wears. And we know that's not how the students of Bergenworth dressed because we literally have like, it's there in black and white on the screen. Like this is what the students wore. They just wore like an academic gown with a, with yes. a, a mortar board. Yes. Whereas this, this figure who's clearly supposed to be Lawrence and they're wearing this like very sort of fancy looking robe with this mask. And it looks like what Willem is wearing, but it's not quite what Willem's wearing. So I always took it to be like, okay, Willem is wearing the uniform of the provost of Bergenworth. And then below it, there's like Lawrence who's wearing like a less ornate version. Cause he's just like one of the, one of the lecturers or one of the staff there. And then the students are below that. And the students are just wearing the academic robes. Interesting. I think he was like a, like a protege of Willem's who sort of moved up. And then he reached this point where it's like, I'm going to challenge my master over who is right and who is wrong, which is sort of the next thing that that happens, I guess, in our little little Lawrence story. Mm -hmm. Before we proceed to that part, the part where Lawrence leaves. Yeah, a lot of things happen when they're searching for their worth in the Bergens. (laughs) Now, Sophie. Yes, so. (laughs) For anyone who's an experienced, blood-born I, I'm looking for a word, but I'm thinking like entrepreneur, but that's not the word I'm thinking. No. What, what word am I thinking when you're exploring something like a bloodborne explorer, a bloodborne investigator? Yeah, but what's the other word? It sounds like entrepreneur. Scholar, interpreter. No, but sounds like that too. Bloodborne. Bloodborne. <laughs> <laughs> so those people. When you say super, those people, <laughs> instead of rephrasing the question, okay, those people. <laughs> when we say when we say thumaru, understand <laughs> what we're talking about. Do we understand what we're talking about? I don't. <laughs> so, for anyone who may be new to Bloodborne. And may not even have noticed that there are chalice dungeons you can go to. and may not even understand what, what chalice is and what is actually happening To be right fair, now. there's a lot of people who played it, like, multiple times and never did the chalice dungeons. That's what happened to me after I finished the game, right? I'm looking at the lore and people are like, you know Queen Yarnum? You know in the dungeons? I'm like, no, I don't know. <laughs> where, are they, where are you getting this information? Can you just briefly tell me... Well, actually, we do have a video on Thumaru, which we will link below... But like a yeah, quick okay. TLDR, well, what, is, what is this Thumaru we keep talking about? So the reason that Lawrence and Bergenworth are interested in Yarnum in the first place <laughs> is that they discover that underneath Yarnum there is a buried series of catacombs. But these catacombs come from a civilization that predates Yarnum like thousands and thousands of years. And they start going down there and they discover three things. They discover that there are these people there that they just call the Labyrinth Watchers. There's these very, very pale, tall people that just sort of seem to moan and scream. There are beasts down there 
which is they're not normal animals. They're these weird sort of like hybrid, like human animal creatures. Some of them have horns and um, some of them can like shoot fire out of their hands. And they, they describe like this howling echoing up the corridors of the catacombs. And they also find this blood. And the blood is being used in rituals that are kind of like the Catholic Eucharist. So they're finding these altars with these like sort of ceremonial cloths on them and all of these like holy objects around them. And they are enshrining these goblets and things that are filled with this blood. And that is why Bergenworth and Lawrence become very interested in learning more about Yana. Because I want to find out well, what, what is going on here. Thank you, Sophie. So, you know, when they go down the labyrinth? Yes. At some point, someone encounters great ones, like things that are a step above blood. Yes, yes. Do Willem and Lawrence encounter any of that? So the other thing that they found down there were what they call the phantasms. And the phantasms are these strange little slugs that they describe as sort of like the augurs of something else. So it's like you find the slug. The slug itself is not terribly significant, but it augurs that something else is going to happen. It's like you're finding like the traces of something that is more advanced. Mm -hmm. So they never actually directly find this thing that's more advanced at the time, but they learn that, oh, down here, somewhere in the tombs, there were these things that were like completely beyond humans. They were completely beyond anything that we know on earth. They were basically these like godlike beings that they just refer to as the great ones. We should probably clarify also like great one is not like a species designation. It literally just means great one. Like there are things down there that are greater than us. So we'll just call them the great ones. Mm -hmm. And this sort of becomes like the next part of the search. Like, okay, well, what was going, what the hell is the deal with these, these great ones? We have to learn more about them. Mm -hmm. Now, Sophie, let me ask you another question. Yeah. If I'm a scholar of Bergenworth and I go down to the catacombs and I see like a tablet or a rune or something, right? Yeah. And then I'll pick it up. Yeah, you're, you're demonstrating this now. You have, what is that? It's like a doorstop? Oh, no, it's a thing that controls the light. It's how they discovered enlightenment. They pick up a rock and they all these lights come on and like, oh my god, it's actually just the control. Just Queen Yarnum's Alexa. I, I'm trying to say something silly, but you're out sillying me, Sophie. <laughs> so where I'm going with this, call to snow, because as you were talking, I had a vision and a thought. And everybody who has been following us for at least two years had the same thought. So we're all expressing our thought to you right now. As you take this little rune or whatever it is, yeah. you turn it around. Yeah. What do you see? You see a little slug. A little slug? <gasps> what does the little slug tell you? Well, well, you have to ask us like a question. Little slug, what are the great ones? And it will turn to you. <laughs> <laughs> and look up at you with its little eye stops. <laughs> and it says to you a voice reverberates through the catacombs <laughs> I cannot tell a lie <laughs> the great ones dwell beyond human understanding you will never see them but it was nice to meet you <laughs> thank you little slug <laughs> we keep alluding to something happening in the future which is influenced by what has happened in the catacombs yes a little oopsie a little oopsie can you tell us about the oopsie that bergenworth did all right so one of the things about Bergenworth is, like, you learn about it sort of, like, I'd say, like, laterally. Like, you get a bunch of information about what they were doing, but the order it was happening in is a little more vague. So when we talk about, like, they discovered the Great Ones, they discovered the blood, they discovered um, the catacombs, like, 
you don't get a sense of the order it happened in. It just sort of all sort of happens at once. Like what they're researching when they're talking about researching Great Ones versus researching Blood, that might have happened at the same time, might have been one mm-hmm. leading to the other. Um, we're not sure. Mm-hmm. But basically, um, the blood that they find in the catacombs, they start experimenting with it and they discover that it has this property. It will start to cause metamorphosis in the thing that it is put in. Again, it's not clear what they were doing. It's not clear, were they putting the blood in animals? Were they putting the blood in people? It's like up in the air. It just says that like, it just calls them metamorphosis and an excessive deviations. Like for instance, throughout um, Bergenworth, you find like these little cages that have animals in them. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely clear if like those maybe were animals they injected with the blood. Or they might have been animals that were already mutated and they found them in the labyrinth. It's not clear. But basically they discover that, like, okay, this blood, when it's in you, it causes your body to change. But the changes that it's making are not static. They're not just the blood does this. It's the blood makes you change. What you change into and how you change are down to the individual person. So... Willem and Lawrence and everyone there, they sort of realize that they could use this blood to, like, force evolve humanity to the next level. They could become something akin to the Great Ones. So this leads to a disagreement between Lawrence and Willem over how this blood is supposed to be used. And when we say a disagreement between Lawrence and Willem, you have to look at that as, like, they were probably the leaders of two different factions in this case. So it's not literally a disagreement between two dudes in a room. It's like... There's like a split. Some students agree with Lawrence, this is the path forward. Some people agree with Willem, this is the path forward. And the path forward is, according to Lawrence, it's if we just keep experimenting with this blood, eventually we'll figure it out. Like if we just keep injecting it into people, studying what happens, if we just experiment and experiment and experiment with this blood, eventually we'll crack it. We'll figure out how to do this thing properly. We'll like reach this level of cosmic ascendancy, right? Mm-hmm. And um, this sort of leads to like Lawrence founding a church, which will happen later on. At this point, he hasn't done that. Yeah. Willem yeah. takes a different point of view. He sort of takes a more conservative point of view, which is that like we will use this only when we are absolutely ready. And he reasons that the whole reason that the great ones were able to like ascend to this higher level to become these cosmic beings is that like they had this degree of completely inhuman knowledge that allowed them to do that. Mm -hmm. So Willem reasons that in order to become something like the great ones, our minds have to be functioning on the level of the great ones before we start experimenting. So we have to already attain all of this cosmic knowledge before we can use this blood to like change ourselves into something else. Lawrence is sort of the other way around. He's like, well, we'll just use the blood, and through using the blood, we will attain the knowledge. Willem is in charge, so what Willem says goes. Mm -hmm. Then there's sort of like, again, the history of Bergenworth, exact sequence of events, there's a lot of question marks over it. The way that everything relates to everything else is sort of clear, but the order is not. Mm -hmm. So at some point, we've talked about this probably happening like when they were initially exploring the labyrinths. They recruit a bunch of people from Yarnum who are experienced beast hunters and they bring those people with them to basically protect them from all the monsters that they're finding. Willem takes them all to this fishing village that he he learns about it. It's not clear how they learn about the fishing hamlet. They just learn at some point that like there is a fishing village, like a whaling town. It's not clear where it is. Presumably it's like reasonably close by because they're able to get there in a world before cars. Unless they're using those ghost carriages. Well, that's possible too. <laughs> this Lawrence episode is now 45 minutes long. We haven't mentioned Lawrence. I love this. So This is going to be a long one. <laughs> yeah. So at some point they learn about this fishing village that has had contact with the Great Ones. So then there is also like a question mark over exactly what happens. The long and short of it is that these beast hunters that Bergenworth recruit, they and Bergenworth go to this fishing village. The beast hunters and Bergenworth go to this village, and the great one that the village is in contact with is summoned. So this is their first encounter with one, and it's this huge sort of like 
whale mermaid thing that comes out of the sea. Now, again, it is confusing about who did what and when. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the in-game item description says that cause washed ashore. However, in the manual, they say cause was killed. Okay, yeah. So the people yeah. of the village, they recite this poem to themselves. Mm -hmm. But you, it's yeah. not subtitled, but you can hear it. Yeah. And one of the lines in it is like, cause we beckoned. Now cause is no more. So they themselves, presumably, they're the ones that call cause out of the ocean. She was like their sort of guardian, like God, like they worshipped her. And they called her out of the ocean. And then when they call her out of the ocean, a massacre takes place in which the beast hunters kill Koz, and they also kill everyone else in the village, pretty much everyone else in the village, from what we can tell. And this is done for basically anatomical research purposes, because they want to look at, like, what makes the people in this village different, what makes Koz different. Like, what is it about these things? If we just take them apart and study them, we'll figure out, like, what we need to do if we're going to, like, evolve to the next level. And isn't there an item description that says something like they drilled holes in their skulls? Yeah, there's a thing where, like, they're cracking the skulls of the people in the village open after death to search to see if their brain has a different structure to it that they call the internal eye. That's so messed up. Yeah, um, but the main thing that they discover is that Cos was pregnant. And they're like, oh my god, why did we do all this? We realized that what we did you was wrong. You think that wrong. would have happened earlier? Gammon <laughs> 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 like, standing on this like pile of murdered people. There's blood everywhere. <laughs> and Lawrence is like, no, German. What we did today was wrong. <laughs> so they they discover that Cos was pregnant. Yeah. And they discover that within the body of Cos's child, who was unborn, there is this organ that they've never seen before. And they're like, okay, this is the key. Because what this is, is a very strange sort of like cord. It's, it actually looks like the cochlea of the ear. It's this, like, spiral-shaped thing with all these, like, weird blobs all over it's it. It's like a little snail. snail yeah, there's, it, it, I think it deliberately they made it look like a snail because, like, the great ones are very mollusk-like. So they look at this organ and they discover that, like, oh, okay, what this organ is is it's the link between cause and the child. So they call it... The third umbilical cord. This is the thing that's like trips people up. It's not literally an umbilical cord. It's some other kind of organ that is like an umbilical cord because it represents the connection. The same way that an umbilical cord physically connects like the child and the parent. This thing spiritually connects the child and the parent. And they realize that like when they hold it because cause is mourning the child. Cos is reaching out, like, where is my child? Cos is sort of drawn to this thing. So Willem realizes, okay, this thing, this is like a great one lure. If I have this, I can kind of tap into the thoughts of the great ones. So this is the point at which the absolute, like, schism happens that leads to Lawrence breaking away. Because Willem is like, okay, now I've got this organ that lets me commune directly with Cos or all the other. Like, it's not clear if it's only Cos or if it's like all the great ones are reaching out for this child. Probably all. If yeah, we yeah. Think of the ending. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's got this this organ. And he's like, all right, I'm going to sit here, and we're just going to experiment with this organ. We're going to use this organ and use its the way, the property that it has that lets us connect to, like, the wisdom of the Great Ones. And we're just going to experiment with this organ and on ourselves, on our minds, essentially, mm -hmm. to see if we can get enough wisdom in our heads that we stand a chance of controlling this blood. Mm -hmm. And this, from what we can tell, it happens once. One of the students there called Rom is sort of presumably like, I don't know if she volunteers or she's selected or something to yeah. attempt to like use this cord and the blood to undergo this metamorphosis into another life form. Mm -hmm. And she like partially succeeds 
in that she does become something that no one has seen before. She does become something that is, like, not a beast. She doesn't sort of go back into becoming, like, a snarling animal, but she becomes this weird caterpillar spider creature Mm -hmm. um, that they name the vacuous spider. It's sort of clear in Japanese, so they basically call her, like, Rom the idiot spider. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, like, Rom tried but she wasn't wise enough she didn't know enough from her meditation and from her like time spent with the court and everything to properly become something else so basically now that rom has used the cord and the blood and turned into a weird spider thing willem's like okay he does the academic thing of further research is needed <laughs> it's like, okay yeah. we we're, he bans the use of the blood he's like we can't we're not ready to do this yet because look what's happened mm-hmm. and that sort of leads to the flare-up between Lawrence and Willem over how do you deal with this blood stuff? Because Willem is saying, we're not ready yet. And because, it, like, Willem is much older than Lawrence. Yeah. Like, Willem is probably, like, in his 60s or 70s at this point. And he's he's sort of a bit, like, he's like a conservative guy. He's set in his ways. He's a bit more passive. And, like, I guess he's already in charge of the university. He does, He's not sort of driven. He's not very ambitious because he's sort of... Like, he has that. nothing to prove. He already wrote, yeah, like, a yeah. thousand papers. He already made yeah. a name for himself. He did, did a colonial genocide. He did everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he's, yeah. he then decides that, okay, we're just going to continuously meditate and continuously learn. And only when everything is perfect will we ever try this again. And Lawrence, who is, like, a younger guy, he's sort of, like, he's just started out on his, like, career as a scholar, from what I can tell. Like, he's no longer a student, but he's sort of, like, he's trying to do more. He wants to make his mark, and he's very driven. He's very driven. Yeah, and he says, well, no, if we just keep experimenting, like... It didn't work with Rom, so we'll just try again, and we'll try again, and we'll try again, and we'll perfect it that way. Mm -hmm. And through that constant process of experimentation, uh, we will learn how to control the substance, and that's how we'll gain knowledge. So there is this schism in Bergenworth, and like I said, um, it makes a lot more sense if you assume that, like, it's not literally just between Lawrence and Willem, it is between two groups of people at Bergenworth who are disagreeing. But Sophie... I have one important question. Thank you, Sin. What is it? Who did Mikolaj side with? Mikolaj sides with Lawrence. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> what did you think? He's with Lawrence now. Who did you think he sided with? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I even said yes. I'm just, I think everybody's just excited to to hear about Mikolaj. He just, he just runs through, he like, <laughs> he runs through the door with the cage on his head and the audience like, woo! It's like Kramer and Seinfeld. <laughs> So, this leads to the big falling out between Lawrence and Willem. Mm -hmm. And they develop this oath at Bergenworth. Plays a key role in the story because it's used as a password, which is fear the old blood. The full oath is we're born of the blood, made men by by the the blood, blood, undone undone by by the blood. blood. Our Our eyes are yet yet to open, open. fear Fear the the old blood. blood. Yes. So, if you want to break the oath down, what it's basically saying is like, our eyes are yet to open, is Willem's part of that. <laughs> He's saying our eyes, by which he means like, you know, our wisdom, our understanding of the world, is too limited. And <laughs> that's why we need to fear the old blood. They're like related phrases. It's like, our eyes are yet to open, therefore fear the old blood. So Lawrence and Willem then have their falling out that leads to Lawrence leaving. <laughs> it's not a particularly volatile falling out. Um, they're not, like, yelling at each other or anything. It's a very polite, like, look, I disagree with your approach. I'm going to go and I'm going to basically start my own institution. That's not mm-hmm. governed by your rules. Lawrence leaves and he leaves and he goes to Yarnum And he takes all the blood with him to continue his experiments elsewhere. And what Willem then does is Willem places someone on guard duty. Yeah. And he says... Don't let Lawrence back in unless Lawrence can recite the oath to me. Because the oath is saying our eyes are yet to open, fear the old blood. Lawrence can come back any time if Lawrence admits he was wrong. Yeah, and of course Lawrence, like, again, he's not a character you you have a great deal of interaction with, but based on the wreckage that he leaves behind, he's clearly quite arrogant. Yeah, yeah. And 
the idea of like admitting that he was wrong is beyond him, so it never happens. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. So this, an hour into the podcast, <laughs> is what leads to uh, Lawrence becoming the vicar. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. Before we proceed, there's one thing we have to address. In the world of Bloodborne, yeah. what is a vicar? All right. So this is, again, um, one of the big question marks that was over the game initially, because it's like very confusing wording. Mm-hmm. So Lawrence's new lab is called the Healing Church. And it has within it a lot of the trappings aesthetically of the Catholic Church. So it's like the main one, of course, is using like there's a ritual involving the blood of God. It's like you imbibe the blood of God, you have this religious experience. It's that, but also the Umbrella Corporation. Um, so his lab, like, it's clearly a laboratory. Like, you go up, you have, like, patient rooms, you have all these, like, people, like, hooked up to drips. You've got, like, people, like, measuring, like, different parts of the body. There's all these, like, Victorian anatomical tools lying around. Like, they're sort of measuring people's heads to watch them swell up. They're, like, sawing into stuff. So it's it's a laboratory. But it has the trappings of a church. It's not necessarily like pretending to be a church. It just is called the Healing Church. So if we're talking real world parallels, I think the Healing Church is basically inspired by the way that hospitals would be set up in churches during like, if there was like a plague or something, or if there was say like if a city was under attack during the war, they would move patients sometimes to churches because churches were like less likely to be bombed because people didn't want to like, bomb the church. And yeah, one of the the movies that's really influential upon Bloodborne is a French action movie called Brotherhood of the Wolf. And every time we bring it up, I would yeah. like to say that I saw Brotherhood of the Wolf when it came out in its original French. It was my favorite movie before it became everybody else's favorite movie because they played Bloodborne. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, and there is a a scene in Brotherhood of the Wolf where they do, in fact, set up a whole lot of beds, hospital beds, Mm -hmm. in a church, and it looks exactly like the one in Bloodborne. It's pretty much the exact same shot. They just copied it. And they have trick weapons in Brotherhood of the Wolf. Yes, they do. They do. They have trick weapons. They have a lot of things in They have the hats. Yeah, they have the hats. The outfits. They have Lady Maria. Lady Maria's in it, played by Monica Bellucci. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Lawrence sets up his lab that is a church. But Sophie, yep. is it also a prison? Yes. Thank you for listening to the Snack Covenant thus far. There is about an hour left. Please take this time to stretch, hydrate and snack. So Lawrence sets up his lab slash church, and because they're using like the trappings of the church, he refers to himself as the vicar of the church. This is again, this is like a translation thing, where obviously like the word vicar is an English word, it's not a Japanese word. So in the um, Japanese script, he's just called Lawrence the leader of the parish. Basically, it's like parish leader Lawrence. So this leads to this confusion over, like, why is the head of the organization called vicar? Because a vicar is, like, a local parish priest. It's not the head of the church. The head of the church would be, like, you know, the archbishop or the pope or something. Why is he the vicar? And it's because the healing church is literally just that building. Like, there's not, like, a big organization that spreads it outside Yarnum. Like, it's just there is, like, that building. It's probably only, like, A few dozen people, I think, make up the church, like the central church organization. Um, It's just a lab, basically. It's a lab that has set up in this city. Yeah. And in Japanese, it's called? The medical... Well, in Japanese, the the name is like... It could be read as like medical church or something. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Medicine church or something. I don't know. It's in line with what you're saying. It's like a lab. It's like a medical lab church. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a medical lab church that's like... it's. 
it's blurring the line, I guess, between being a medical establishment and being a religious establishment, because the point of the organization is to, like, have these ecstatic experiences where you interact with God. But it's doing it through, like, what they see as being, like, a scientific, methodical way of doing it. It's not, but they see it that way. So basically, yeah, it's like we're trying to figure out how to just through the use of like controlled substances and like bleeding and different amounts of water in your system and everything, what will lead to these like moments of ecstasy in which you you meet the great ones. They're like, we're going to figure out God through a randomized control trial. It's not even a randomized control trial. They're just shoving stuff in people's brains. I'm sorry. I gave Lauren it's just They've just got like a blackboard and it's like stuff to shove in people's brains. Seawater. Okay, cross. <laughs> <laughs> Mikolash walks in and puts an X next to slug. It says I'm not talking about it. <laughs> so Lauren's starts his own medical church. Back, when, back before red tape stopped you doing that. Try to start your own medical church today. You have to sign all these forms. They insist on all these tests. How are small business owners supposed to succeed in Yarnum in the 21st century? I'm just standing up for the law guy. Thank you, Sophie. So Lawrence, love Bergenworth, went to Yarnum where he's not from. Yes, this is the key point. Yes. Yeah, and he convinced the whole community to basically let him into their city, let him inhabit this church, let him start his freaky experiments, let him experiment on people. He must have been like a good speaker, charismatic, or at least like cute or something. How did he do all that? Okay, so now we're getting into like Yanam itself as a city. So the thing that we know about Yarnum, okay, we know we know two significant things about Yarnum. The first is that it is very, very, very xenophobic. They will tolerate the presence of outsiders because from what we can tell, like, you never get a geographical sense of where Yarnum is, but they know enough about outsiders for there to be, like, a means of dealing with them. And outsiders know about Yarnum as a place that doesn't tolerate outsiders. So... You know, it's not like a little tiny village where you walk in like, oh, stranger, I ain't seen you around these parts before, <laughs> or something like that. It's like a, um, it's like a big, big like city. It's like the size of like London or something. It mm-hmm. has obvious like it has docks in it. It has aqueducts and stuff. So mm-hmm. it's somewhere that like people are coming and going from. My my assumption with it, and this is just me assuming, like it's not. No one ever says this, but my assumption with Yarnum is like it's like a port city somewhere. Mm-hmm. So like ships have to go there, they have to dock to resupply and then leave. Like that's the impression I got. And it's like it's kept afloat through like trade, basically, with like the outside world. And that would also explain why there is this like fishing village nearby because it's coastal. Yeah. And you you can see the ocean if you like get really high up in the game. Like if you get like upper cathedral ward and you look out, you will see the ocean in the distance. That is Mostly, I think, because the game just, if there's a blank spot, it will render water to just fill it in. But I think it does make sense to assume this place that has these, like, big aqueducts and these, like, docks and everything is probably a port city. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, so Lawrence goes to this place that is, like, very, very notoriously xenophobic. A place that, like, outsiders are, like, only going to out of necessity, but they're scared of it. Mm-hmm. And he's welcomed in. And he sort of, he sets himself up as, like, I, I liken him almost to, like, a crime boss or something. If you are a cultist who understands what is happening right now, please leave a comment to explain to newcomers what this interlude means. Thank you and back to the podcast. Where he's not necessarily someone in a position of actual political authority, but he sort of owns the city. Mm-hmm. And that happens very, very rapidly. The exact mechanics by which that happens, like, no one ever says, like, okay, here's what Lawrence did. But the simplest way to look at it is, like, Yarnum's obsessed with blood. Even before Lawrence goes there, it's obsessed with blood. Like, they talk about the Yarnumites are, like, they're making blood cocktails and drinking them at night. They're telling stories to each other, like, while they drink the blood about how outsiders are bad. And, like, we said at the start, 
Yanam is built above this network of catacombs that had the blood in it. So it's like, we're going to skip ahead here a little bit. <laughs> what happened is that civilization that was obsessed with the blood and had the like pale people and the beasts and everything, over time that just became Yarnum over like thousands and thousands of years. Like that civilization just built upon itself and built upon itself. And then like the Yarnumites are just like, you know, after a thousand years, 2000 years, whatever, the Yarnumites have become like a separate civilization to where they started. They've just evolved out of it. So part of the Yarnamites xenophobia comes down to the fact that they view their blood as sacred. So it's not just that like the people from outside are from outside and they're bad. It's the people from outside, they have this blood that is lesser than our blood. And we don't want like the blood of outsiders mixing with our blood, which is very pure. So they have this whole like blood purity concept. And what Lawrence has with him when he goes to Yarnum for the first time, is he's got that old blood. He's got that blood from the catacombs. And even though no one explicitly says this, like, that has to be the reason he was let in. Because you have this city that is obsessed with, like, our blood is special, our blood is pure, we hate outsiders. Let's an outsider in to, like, become this influential figure, and what he has with him is literally the blood of your ancestors. So, like, it he literally had nothing else. So it, it has to be that. Now, Sophie. Yes. You know, we're speaking about him going to this town and setting up his lab. Yeah. So in the real world. In the real world. <laughs> to start your lab, to start your project, you need funding. And funding can come from various sources. It can come from government grants. Yeah. It can come from pharma. can mm-hmm. come from generous benefactors and uh, <laughs> that's, that's not what there... Lawrence said it is a generous <laughs> benefactor <laughs> because well there are generous benefactors living around Yarnum a little north I guess because it's snowing <laughs> it only snows in the north that's true <laughs> thank you Sophie that's how you know it's north <laughs> yes um, and of course, we're talking about Kanehurst. Kanehurst. So, do you think at this point, Lauren started sort of making connections and socializing with the aristocracy, and maybe pitching the idea of a little church, a little medical thing? If you fund me, you know, I can I can do stuff, and uh, we can have a mutually beneficial. We'll have a backer reward. Backer rewards. <laughs> what? He's got backer rewards. It's what like is a that? Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Oh, backer, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, you're a little bit Australian and I'm a little bit uh, Slavic. Why does no one on this podcast have a normal accent? <laughs> so, <laughs> my Slavic brain kept hearing Baka rewards. I'm like, what? Why is she saying Baka rewards? I think that's the Slavic brain. I think that's your reborn brain. Thank <laughs> you, Sophie. Ah! Ciao, Poison Poison cooking. <laughs> Do you know, oh, by the way, unrelated thing. Did you know that if you take a baseball bat and swing it really hard, it turns into a katana? I I didn't try yet because I yeah. don't have a baseball bat, okay, but okay, if, yeah. if you have one, you can try. We'll have to try. Okay, okay. That's going to be a viral video. <laughs> Testing Hitman Reborn abilities in real life. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Hello, Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast, <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> it's it's Sophie from Sinclair Law. You know that that really popular channel. So my question is, mm-hmm. do you think at this point he was sort of trying to get some money out of Kinehurst to set up his church? I don't think he's he's engaged with Kinehurst yet. I think that happens later. Okay. But again, this all these question marks over exactly what's happening. But the Kinehurst thing I think comes later on, yes. Okay. 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 Now Sophie, yes. you mentioned another thing. Um where he's getting participants, right? He's telling he's recruiting people... recruiting participants for the study. He's yes. putting up flyers. <laughs> Are you between 24 and 35 and have trouble sleeping? Oh Why not have seawater injected into your brain? Oh, my God. The way that Lawrence gets participants is that the church has two halves to it. It has, like, a front and a back. 
And the front looks like we were saying, like when hospitals are set up in churches, it looks like a makeshift hospital. There's like some beds along the side of the, the church hall. Um, there's doctors there, like taking like measurements of everything. Their patients mm-hmm. are being looked after. The patients are in the bed. And then what will happen is they will start injecting this blood into them. Mm-hmm. And if the patient responds favorably, as far as they're concerned, like something starts to happen to them, like mm-hmm. they, their brain starts to like change shape or whatever it is. They start hearing voices. Yeah. They conveniently go, Oh, uh, your condition's worsened. We'll have to take you to the back room. And then that patient is taken to a, an inaccessible part of the church. So yeah. the second part of the church, it's only accessible if you have a certain pendant on you that works like a key card. No one gets to see this apart from the doctors and the people they bring back there. Mm-hmm. And it's it's accessed via an elevator. Mm-hmm. So at the top of the elevator, there are all of these rooms with all these patients mm-hmm. in them. And instead of it looking like you know a place people go to get healed, it looks like a cross between an experimental laboratory and like a sort of Victorian like mental asylum. Mm-hmm. So there's all these people who are strapped to the to their beds, like screaming in straight jackets and not allowed out. There's like bodies just sort of like lying around they've experimented on. There's people whose like skulls are being measured with like calipers. You can see people having like like their heads are sort of being cut open, having things stuck in them. The the patients there are all experiencing these like strange mutations. So like some of them, like their whole body is sort of consumed by their head and they just become a huge head there's people who have tentacles coming out of their throat there's people who are like still very like cognizant but they're going mad and they're screaming like just let me out of here Mm -hmm. and and there's people who like they are in the straight jackets and so they can't move their arms or legs so they're crawling around like a worm and there's some people that have like reverted back to being like an animal sort of state so they'll be like running around on all fours like screaming and growling and they're all locked in all these different rooms and that's sort of what the church is really doing Mm -hmm. at the very top of that um there are these people that they call like the living failures who are kind of what happened with rom they're not quite as advanced as rom in the sense that they just look like big sort of blue people with squished heads yeah. But they're sort of the ones that are, like, starting to come in contact with the cosmos. They're the ones who are starting to, like, reach out mentally into, like, other planes of existence. And they, when you encounter them, like, they can sort of reach into space and, like, pull, like, meteorites down. And sort of open yeah. these, like, portals and things. They can um, create these balls of light with their hands and things like that. So that's sort of, like, that's kind of as far as it got. But... That's what the back of the church is like. So that's what they're really doing. So there is a question hanging over it of like, well, does Lawrence actually want to cure people or not? Because like the blood clearly does have healing properties. Yeah. Like when you use it, like you use it on yourself in the yeah. game, it does heal yeah. you. <laughs> um, and like, we don't know exactly how many like people, like what the percentage of people that sort of got treated and then went to the back was like some people may actually have shown up and gotten a dose and then felt fine and gone home. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just to do with how they react to it. But yeah, the the healing aspect of the healing church is like, that's just like a spin he puts on it. He's like, he's basically just wants a way to get access to people. So he says, bring me, bring me your sick. I will heal them. And then maybe like one in 10 or one in five or whatever is like, Oh, they have to go to the back room. And that's how he gets his subjects. And the thing is, like, no one in Yarnum knows what's happening in the back room apart from the church. Yarnum just sees, like, there is a doctor tending to patients in a church. Interesting. It's interesting you say that because my vision of Lawrence, again, painted by my own experiences. Yeah, yeah. Is, um, <laughs> I think your version is much better, but I kind of <laughs> imagine him as <laughs> literally coming into this town. Being like, hey, guys, guess what? I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I know you guys love blood, okay? Well, listen, 
I can make you better blood. I just need a couple of subjects, which is going to go to a couple of things, just a couple of injections, come on over. And then with the people that, you know, react the way he wants to the blood, he's like, hey, you're extra special. You mean so much to me and yeah, to the study. Yeah. Let's, go out, let's go up the elevator. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some more stuff. Again, I guess I was thinking of him as more of a straightforward scientist, but just like tricking people into just participating in his well, studies. In, in a very old episode, we likened him to the monorail salesman from The Simpsons. <laughs> he shows up with all of this blood. Ah, you wouldn't be interested. It's more of an ace idea. <laughs> <laughs> we have now established that Lawrence is a young, charismatic, confident man. Well, I don't know how young he is at this point. So the, the statue we were talking about. It's pretty old. Well, it's hard to tell because like. It's like 30 or something. It's like 30. <laughs> so what we're talking about with regard to this image, right, is it's what we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Where there's a statue that represents someone who's dressed similar to, but not exactly like Wilton. Yeah. So there's that figure in the center. They have a quite long beard. And then either side of them, you've got, uh, there's like two, two people in healing church, sort of like doctor outfits, but they don't have faces. And there's a figure on the sort of table that he's operating on, which again, it just looks like a sort of corpse. It doesn't look like a person. And then under that, there is a beast crawling. Um, and since the figure in the middle is like clearly in charge, and they're also the only one who has a proper face. Everything else just looks like it's symbolic. Yeah. Um, that figure is probably supposed to be Lawrence. Mm -hmm. It's his church. He has a statue of himself. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's symbolic. It's like, this is Lawrence. And then either side of him are Lawrence's doctors. And we're all protecting you from the beast that is under the bed. Basically. It's, it's not like complicated. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 I say that because someone once left like an essay length comment about how Lawrence is actually the person on the table. Oh. And um, that wouldn't be very good Lawrence, advertising. But, <laughs> you know, knowing Lawrence, maybe his idea was like, I'm the person in the middle. I'm also the person on the side. I'm, I'm also the person them. on the table. I'm all, yeah, it all presents me. So it's like the old spy sands. <laughs> really? I'm in front of you. I'm beside me. Now I'm on the table. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Sophie. Yes, Sin. Bergenworth had an adage. Fear the old blood trademark. <laughs> Now, did Lawrence have one? Yes, Lawrence had a remarkably similar one that just uh, changes the order of the words a little bit. Lawrence's relationship with the adage forms like a key part of sort of the story. And mm -hmm. there's actually three variations of the adage that you encounter. You actually encounter them in reverse order. You have the adage that Lawrence remembers, which is Willem's one, which is fear the old blood. The blood makes us human, makes us more than human, makes us human no more. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. The only way to learn that is to physically touch Lawrence's skull and, like, absorb his memory. And the reason you have to do that is, like, no one else in the healing church seems to know that adage. You can see at the door where the password guy is, like, healing church people have tried escaping and they can't because they don't know the adage. A lot of the organization is trying to get back to Bergenworth and they can't do it because no one knows the adage other than Lawrence. And Lawrence is at this point no longer with us. You encounter the current vicar of the healing church, whose name is Amelia. Mm -hmm. And she's got a remarkably similar adage, but she's saying, seek the old blood. Our thirst for blood satiates us, soothes our fears. Seek the old blood. So Lawrence has at some point inverted the adage from fear it to seek it. And you hmm. see that develop when you go to the Hunter's Nightmare. There is presumably like a previous vicar of the healing church is there. Um, a lot of people think that's Vicar Amelia. And I'm just going to say like, it's not because her dialogue is different and it's different in a specific way. And this is the part that's important. She leaves parts of it out. So the part where 
she's saying seek the old blood is actually left out of the nightmare version. Instead, she's just talking about, like, were it not for fear, death would go unlamented. Were it not for fear, death would go unlamented. So they haven't quite gotten to seek the old blood yet. So basically, Lawrence leaves, he has his adage, which is like, fear the old blood, that over time they forget to fear it, but they're not seeking it. And then by the time that the game is actually set, so like we'll say like 20 years later, it's completely inverted to seek the old blood. And then a few years later, it's like, chug the old blood. A few years later, it's like, <laughs> Just like me and Japanese slippers. Yeah. So yeah, you can see like Willem's adage, it starts off being ignored and then it ends up being the opposite of what he said. So the whole institution sort of implodes on itself. Thank you, Sophie. Now, Sophie. Yes. I heard some rumors. What's the tea, girl? Old Yarnum. Common Lawrence W. <laughs> <laughs> so Old Yarnum is one of the Healing Church's many L's. Um... Exactly when Old Yarnum happens is one of those things that's like, we don't 100% know exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the game is not big on, like, having a sort of set out timeline of, like, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. We know they all did happen. And you can sort of group them into, into like, this thing happened a long time ago. This thing happened Mm -hmm. sort of recently. This thing happened just then. But... An exact chronology is like kind of never really provided to you. The way that you you fig if you I don't think you you need to figure it out, but if you want to figure it out, like you just look at like okay, causally what led to what, like who knows what, what do they get out of this, and you know later something will happen that will require them to have known the thing that they learned then. So like that's sort of how you do it. Now, Sophie. Yes, sir. Lawrence has his own institution. Mm-hmm. His own adage. He's got it all. Well, he is missing one thing. He doesn't have a baby. Doesn't have a baby. So the whole research hall thing doesn't really go anywhere. Oh. I know they've been like shoving seawater in people's brains. They've been strapping people to beds. They've been conducting all sorts of unethical experiments. They've been torturing people. And the closest they get is that uh, there's a lady in a chair who hallucinates that there's slugs in her brain and then she gives you the ability to turn into cauliflower. Say what you will about Lawrence, but there seems to be... (laughs) It's not even Lawrence, it's us, we do that. The experiment (laughs) only works because we do... It's possible they didn't even know it was happening. That's true. We're actually a better scientist than Lawrence, so we don't have any dialogue. Actually. Yeah. But if you look at the big picture, okay... The big picture, and it's just like the church is on fire and it's all fully straight. Okay, look at the big picture, though. All those massacres have been taken completely out of context. God. <laughs> so the Healing Church did produce some people with enlarged heads. Yes! <laughs> but then, out of that, they produced blue people with enlarged heads who can summon yeah. meteorites and open portals. Again, like, um, cause Sin and I both work in like academic research. That's the sort of thing that does happen. It's like someone will spend like five years doing something and the end result will be, yeah, this made this thing a little bit bigger. Yeah. And it's just like, that's just there to be the building block of in like 10 years time. If someone is interested in it, they, that might form the basis of something else. So, like, a lot of, like, research is just discovering, like, a really tiny thing or, like, this yeah, thing didn't... Yeah. Like, saying something didn't work is also, like, a valid outcome. Because then you know it doesn't work. Like, yeah. Yeah. But the problem is, in research, it's not as pizzazzy as yeah, yeah. finding something that does work. Yeah, yeah. What we're saying is that Iron Man is only partially based on fact. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know, I guess. Yeah. Celestials, would you say they're the result of the choir or Lawrence? They seem to happen after Lawrence. After Lawrence, so yeah. you know, he did 
give the building blocks for potentially making yeah, some but this is what this is what I think we're getting with this because Lawrence is like, okay, none of this has worked. What do we need that like other people have tried? We're going to look at all the academic databases that we have. And he's sitting there and he's like, oh. remember the fishing hamlet? Yeah, he's like, <laughs> we're going to have to get a baby. He's like, I, I didn't want to grow up to be my pretend professor dad, but I've got my lab, I've got my oath, I really need my own baby if this is going to work. Where do we get a baby? So one of the beast hunters that worked with Bergenworth was a lady who was several generations back part of a royal bloodline. Mm-hmm from a place called Canehurst. And the people of Canehurst, this may sound familiar, they're quite tall and quite pale. And they really have a thing for blood. And they also, um, they have to employ people to get rid of all these weird beast monsters that keep arising. And Lawrence is like, hmm. He's like, you know, I've been working with you for 10 years at this point, And I've suddenly realized that oh what you're describing, remarkably similar to what we found uh, in the catacombs directly beneath the place that we're currently in. I'm wondering if these two things that are the same and right next to each other might in some way be connected. So Lawrence is like, okay, think back to the last colonial genocide. You've done this before. You can do it again. Oh, no. What if we do that again? but in this Canehurst place. So this is what leads to like part of the story that is like quite um, opaque. Mm -hmm. I think because like it was going to play a larger role in sort of like the direct narrative of the game. And then they kind of cut it out and then kind of like replaced parts of that with a different story. So like the Canehurst thing, it's, simultaneously massively important and also like a weird dead end that just sort of like floats off to the side. Mm -hmm. Like it's a completely optional place you never need to go to. You don't really get anything out of it. It's just like filling in the background of what happened. Yeah. So there's like one person in the whole game who fills you in on what happened with Kanehurst. Ah, so his information must be very accurate. He must have been to Kinehurst. He must be a fellow of the Kinehurst people, huh? All right, so this is, again, leading into something that, like, the game does not explicitly tell you, but if you look at how things fit together, that's sort of what's going on. Most of our information about Kinehurst initially comes from a guy called Alfred. And um, Alfred is interesting because when you meet him, he recognizes that you're an outsider to Yanam. And he says to you, oh, you're a hunter of beasts. That's how I started. So again, it's not 100% like set in stone, but the implication is like Alfred is just someone who came from outside of Yanam, ended up in Yanam, was hunting beasts in Yanam, and then he sort of like fell into obsessing over Canehurst as a result of that. And he talks about this figure called like the eminent Marta Ligarius. And he talks about how like Marta Ligarius led his executioners to Canehurst because like the, the blood of Canehurst was going to defile the blood of the church. But the way Alfred talks about it, it's like he's reciting something he's been told. Like he wasn't there. He doesn't know how to get to Canehurst. He's trying to get to Canehurst, but he can't do it. And he's desperate because he's asking a literal stranger outsider, yeah, like, hey, yeah. if you ever get an invitation, I hear they're flying around. You let me know, okay? No, yeah, that is what happens. Because, like, he's you meet him, he's, like, he's quite young. I don't think they have canonical ages, but, like, he looks to be, like, sort of in his, like, 20s. And he's like, hey, like, oh, you're hunting beasts. I used to hunt beasts as well. And then I discovered the good word of Marta Ligarius. And he's reciting all this stuff about Marta Ligarius and the executioners in Canehurst and stuff, but he can't get to Canehurst. He can only get there if you let him go there, but he's like obsessing over Canehurst. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is the source of most of your information about Canehurst until you get there. And when you get there, 
it's kind of a different story, although not really. So the thing that Alfred tells you that is the tip off that like, oh, this guy doesn't really know the full story is that he says all the stuff that's going on at Kanehurst with all these like people that are chugging old blood and there's like something about them that is like a danger to the rest of Yarnum and everything. He says that's because of Bergenworth. So he's very clear it was Bergenworth that create the situation at Kanehurst. Mm-hmm. And he says, a, the, the line is, a scholar of Bergenworth brought the old blood to Kanehurst Castle. So Alfred is obsessed with the church. He knows the church sort of comes from Bergenworth, because he's also the guy who tells you about Bergenworth. But he does not hold the church accountable for that. He says it was Bergenworth. So from Alfred's point of view... There's, like, Bergenworth, and then, like, the smart people, the good people, leave Bergenworth, found the Healing Church, and then there's another, like, bad guy from Bergenworth. And he was irresponsible, and he brought all this blood to Kanehurst and caused this sort of, like, line of, like, corrupted people to emerge, right? Yeah, yeah. So, the scholar is never actually identified. Like, no one mentions who it was. They don't say, like, well, there's this guy called Mikalash or this guy called German or this guy called Lawrence or anything. Like, who, who brought the blood there? So yeah. the, the solution to that is actually in the Kanehurst dining room. There are these portraits. One of the portraits is a man with sort of, like, uh, he has, like, a sort of short gray beard and he has, like, shoulder-length gray hair. So this figure in the portrait is wearing a number of things that are very significant. Mm -hmm. The most significant thing he's wearing is he has this sort of clasp around his neck that looks like the steering wheel of a ship. That ship? The Titanic. (laughs) That clasp is the clasp that the church servants wear. It's like the big, Mm -hmm. tall, pale guys around Cathedral Ward. They have that clasp on them. So, like, he's identifying himself as, like, he's part of the Healing Church. Mm -hmm. He's also wearing a gold pendant above that. And we know that, although the design is not, like, 100% the same, um, we know from Amelia that, like, there's a gold pendant that's passed down. Yeah. through the vicars of the church. Like, everyone gets... Yeah. The, whoever is in charge of the church currently has his pendant. And the mm-hmm. other thing that he's wearing, which is a little... It's sort of in the realm of, like, does this count? Does it not count? Is he's wearing a church robe, but it's an older design of the church robe that they actually didn't end up using properly in the game. Um, so that part's, like, not as explicit, but the, the wheel clasp and the gold pendant absolutely are. And like we said, this character is like an older look. He's like sort of middle-aged man. He looks to be like maybe in his like 40s or something. And um, he is in the Kanehurst portraits. So that's really interesting because why does Kanehurst have a portrait of someone from the Healing Church in there if Kanehurst and the Healing Church hate each other? Keep in mind that like it's in an area full of portraits of like significant people. So it's it's not like... He got tagged in a photo with a bunch of other Kanehurst people. He was, like, in the background somewhere. Like, they actually sat down and they made a specific portrait of him to hang alongside portraits of, like, you know, the Queen and portraits of, yeah. like, you know, like, the knights and the royalty and everything. There's this guy there who is straight up, like, dressed like he is from the Healing Church. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, okay. The relationship between the Healing Church and Kanehurst it wasn't that they were just, like, at odds from the beginning. Like, they were actually working together at some point. And, they, like, they were significant. And then it's like, well, Alfred's talking about a scholar from Bergenworth doing all this. Even though he was technically in charge of the Healing Church at the time, Lawrence is still a scholar of Bergenworth. That's, that's on his academic record. So... <laughs> <laughs> when Alfred says a scholar of Bergenworth brought the old blood to Kanehurst, he's not wrong. It just that the scholar was Lawrence, and he'd already left Bergenworth and founded a church by that point. Mm-hmm. So we're going to assume that the guy in the painting is Lawrence. Okay, so then you ask yourself, all right, Lawrence is the one who brought the old blood to Kanehurst. Lawrence is the one that led to the creation of like the vile blood sort of blood family of Kanehurst by giving them all this blood. 
Um, and then Lawrence had them all killed. Why did Lawrence do that? Because he's a friggin' asshole. Well, I mean, he is, but like, there's more, there's more to it than that. <laughs> is there precedent for, say, um, uh, some sort of like scholar who's interested in in learning about the great ones, ingratiating themselves into somewhere, and then when they have produced the thing that you want, having them all killed to get the thing? Allegedly. Allegedly. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Lawrence is like, forgive us, cause forgive us, cause for murdering your child. Allegedly. Allegedly. (laughs) So you have to look at like, well, what's in Lawrence's past, right? Lawrence was involved in a situation where in order to get access to a bunch of like great one guts and like great one baby stuff and learn about the anatomy of like the people who were associated with the great ones in order to get that, a bunch of scholars kind of ingratiated themselves into a society of people who were the kind of people they wanted to cut up and steal organs from. And um, when the society provided to them the thing that they wanted, whether that's, you know, summoning cause or perhaps having a child with a great one, um, once they were no longer useful, they called in a third party. In uh, Bergamot's case, it was the hunters. In the Kanehurst case, it's the executioners. So they call in a third party to sack the place and just steal the thing that they need. Considering that is literally what Lawrence did like 20 years beforehand, and everything he's done has in some way copied what happened at Bergenworth, um, I think it's pretty obvious, even though no one outright says that this exact sentence, that Lawrence is the one who brought the old blood there so that the queen would conceive a child that Lawrence could then use in his experiments. And after the queen conceived, he called the executioners in to sack the place so he could steal the child. Yeah. So again, like the other thing about Kanehurst is when you eventually go there, it's presented as like the aftermath of something terrible that's happened. So like the, the first thing you see upon entering the castle is that like, there's these ghosts and they're crying they're like weeping over like all of the dead from the battle. The way it's sort of framed to you is not like this is the scene of like the awesome confrontation between Kanehurst and, and the executions. It's like this was just like everyone got massacred. Yeah. And you yeah. see like um we mentioned like the portraits. The portraits are in the dining room, and you see that like the dining room is smashed up and there's like all of these ghosts in the dining room. Mm-hmm. So you get the impression that like they attacked and like they didn't know it was coming. This wasn't like a pitched battle, but they just showed up. And like it was like the middle of dinner or something. And they just ran in and just like murdered everybody. I also just want to add here, because like I've said this before, and people people think I'm too nice about Kanehurst. So I just want to say that like I'm sure the Kanehurst people were also pricks. They were a bunch of like aristocrats. They possibly drank the blood of the people below them. They had, like, their own beast problem. They had knights that were, like, putting down the beasts and everything. They were probably also super into, like, racial purity and everything. I'm not saying they were perfect. I'm just saying that sometimes, no matter who it is, it's bad to murder everyone to steal a baby. The moral of Bloodborne is it's bad to murder everyone to steal a baby. That's the moral of the story. The moral of the story (laughs) of Bloodborne. It's firstly, always be yourself. Hi, Sophie here. Sid and I hope you enjoyed the first part of our two-part discussion of Lawrence, a character with four lines. This episode was about the events of Lawrence's life, as explained directly by the game itself. In the second episode, we'll destroy all the goodwill we built up fitting this incredibly complicated story together by talking about how Lawrence made us feel. Remember that the moral of Bloodborne is to always believe in yourself, but not quite as much as this guy did. Thank you for listening. There's significantly more Bloodborne content available on the Sinclair Lore channel if you somehow weren't aware of this, because let's face it, it's the only thing we do that anyone really pays attention to. So Lawrence now has a great one baby of his very own. (laughs) 
So this is where things get a little confusing in terms of the timeline. I think it might be a good idea to actually leave Old Yarnum out, um, because we have a video on Old Yarnum already. And if you want to know about Old Yarnum, you can just watch that. Yeah. The TLDR, um, the church uh, decided to experiment on Old Yarnum with its blood to see what it did. Didn't work. So now Lawrence, Lawrence has a bouncing baby great one of his very own. And he's like, finally, it's my time to commit infanticide. Oh my god. So he gets from that the third chord thing that Willem had. And he uses that third chord to make contact like Willem is doing. So we're now getting into yet another, this is never directly said in the game, but it's, it's what's going on because that's what makes sense of what everyone's actually doing. As far as the game itself is concerned, right? Lawrence leaves the healing church as in physically he goes out of it. He never comes back again. And at some point, his skull is found. And his skull is clearly like a, a monster beast skull. It's not a human skull. And that skull is brought back and it's put on the altar as like an object of worship. So at some point, like, never, you never see this, it's never talked about, but Lawrence leaves the church. At some point after that, he transforms into a beast. Um, he can't control the blood like he thought. He transforms. And his skull is then returned to the healing church. And at some point before he transforms into a beast, he has made what it just calls a contract with another great one that he summons using that third chord that he got from um, the child of the vile bloods. Mm -hmm. So post Kanehurst, again, we have very little concrete information about what Lawrence does, but it's again, there's situations mm -hmm. where you look at like, what is everyone actually doing? Like, who is where? Who is doing what? What is the outcome? And then from that, you can figure out, okay, well, we sort of know his motivation now. Mm -hmm. So as far as, like, direct information that we're given, we are told that Lawrence has physically left the church and never come back. He just leaves. Like, he, he has one of those, like, pendant keys lets you back in. So he takes that with him and he leaves. At some point... He also makes contact with one of the Great Ones successfully. So he does what Willem did in the Hamlet, but instead of summoning Cause the Weird Mermaid Whale, he summons a weird pile of veins from the sky, who is called Flora, uh, or just the Moon Presence, if you want. So he makes contact with her, and then it says that they establish a contract. The exact nature of the contract, they don't ever tell you what the contract is explicitly, but we'll get into what it is later. This contract leads to the creation of something called the Hunter's Dream, which is basically the place where Flora was summoned is this little chapel. And when Flora is like makes this contract, she creates a sort of facsimile of that little chapel. It's a chapel that's used as a workshop by the hunters that are hunting the beasts in Yarnum. And so what Flora basically does is she creates like a haven for the hunters to go to. She creates like there's a safe space you can go to where you can work on your weapons and everything. And then from there you can hunt the beasts. And there is a sort of link created between the hunters and that hunter's dream so that if they're killed, instead of dying, they sort of snap back to the dream and wake up like what they just went through was a dream itself. So this means that like functionally um as long as flora is overseeing you you can't die all of those deaths you go through are treated by your psyche like it was just a dream and you wake up and you can try again that's not super important that's just what the hunter's dream is so we know lawrence was involved in the beckoning of flora and the conception of that dream and then we know some point after that he transformed into what it just calls the first cleric beast we also know this because we find Lawrence's skull is identified explicitly as being Lawrence's skull, and it's clearly not a human skull. It looks like like a gorilla skull. The shape of it is very sort of like besides this huge jaw and these like deformed sort of like has like cracks in it and everything. Um, clearly, something horrible happened, and he is he is a monster now. Well, he's dead now, but he's a monster. So that was the end of Lawrence as far as like Lawrence's physical existence goes. The 
technical, like, actual end of Lawrence's story is that if you go into the Hunter's Nightmare, you will find a huge burning uh, beast who's, like, lying on the church altar. That's the same altar where Lawrence's skull was. And he's carrying the, the pendant key that Lawrence used to get in and out of the church. He's not identified as Lawrence yet, but when you are in the research hall area, you will find a sort of, because it's the nightmare, it doesn't follow physical rules, you will find Lawrence's human skull. So it's like Lawrence's skull, if he wasn't a beast, it's a human skull. And if you take that skull to the beast on the altar, it will recognize it. And it will sort of try to grab it from you, like it'll lash out, like give that to me. That's the extent of, like, the interaction with Lawrence. Like, Lawrence, no, there's no more dialogue. He doesn't say anything. You're encountering, like, this sort of maddened, burning beast version of Lawrence that sort of doesn't really have any humanity left. And the whole point is, like, it's fighting you because what you have with you is its humanity. And it's trying to grab that back from you, but it doesn't have any. So, in a sense, like, what you're encountering there isn't really Lawrence. It's, like, Lawrence is gone and there's just this like monster left that has a dim memory of like being Lawrence and wants to get that humanity back, but it can't get it. So that is, that is the end as far as like what you are directly told and shown uh, Lawrence's story. So when you fight Lawrence, Mm -hmm. he's the cleric beast boss. Oh shit. Sorry. Oh my God. Oh my God. Lawrence. I'm sorry. Sorry. I talked crap. So do you think he looked like a cleric beast boss, IRL? Okay, so cleric beast is a little uh, slightly confusing piece of terminology. Because there's a boss in the game that is just called cleric beast, right? Yeah. Which gives the impression, I think, that like cleric beast is a species of beast. So if you look at the way that cleric beasts are talked about in the game, It's not specifically that, like, there's one thing called a cleric beast. It's that cleric beasts are grouped together because when clerics transform into beasts, the beast form that they get is, like, much larger and much stronger than a normal beast. And this is sort of explained, like, it's explained in an interview with Miyazaki, and I think they actually say this in-game, but it's also, like, it's, it's also like it's hinted at and implied and everything in the descriptions and everything. But like what happens is if you're a cleric of the healing church, you're trying much harder to hold on to your humanity because you know what's coming. You're like repressing the beasthood. Yeah, you're repressing it in a sense. But it's like because you know that like the purpose of this organization is to advance humanity, but you risk becoming a beast. You're trying harder and harder to stay human. You're trying harder and harder to repress, like, the beast urge that is in you. So when you finally transform, it's really violent because it's all been repressed and it all just bursts out of you at once, whereas um, you encounter people like, like Gilbert in the game. Gilbert's an outsider who turns into a beast, but, like, for him it's... A much faster process like he comes to yarn and he takes some blood and then he becomes a beast later on and he just becomes like a sort of like human sized like hairy thing like the patients that you find around that have become beasts follow that principle as well like they're just they're just people that are turning into beasts whereas when a cleric does it it's like a massive monstrosity because they have been trying so hard to like hold it all back and they've it's like all repressed and it's all burst out of them it's like me when I don't eat sushi for a month. Yes. Then I get so much sushi. They yeah. send me like four chopsticks. And yeah. I'm like, <laughs> no, it's all for me. The reason that like the cleric beast on the bridge is called the cleric beast is because it's it's just a cleric who became a beast. But like Vicar Amelia is a cleric beast. Yeah. Like she's the vicar of the church she transforms into this like huge sort of like fox thing because she's been holding it back the blood starved beast in old Yarnum is a cleric beast because they've been holding it back for that long um even like the suspicious beggar he becomes a like a much larger beast because he's been repressing it ludwig becomes like an absolute like hideous monstrosity it's like, what have you been repressing, Ludwig? Cause... Yeah, so it's all bursting. So that's what cleric beast means. It means like a beast that is like much bigger because it's a cleric. And they actually specify like in when they talk about like the way the hunter weapons developed that like 
the um the reason that the hunters start off with like sort of very fast weapons um fast sort of light weapons like daggers and swords and things is that they're just fighting like beasts that are the size of people and then when the clerics start to transform which is like starts with lawrence when they start to transform because they're becoming something bigger they need to rethink the way they design the weapons so they start creating like the kirk hammer and like ludwig's holy blade and stuff because those are like big heavy weapons that are designed to fight like beasts that are like the size of a car so that's what cleric beast means it just means a beast that used to be a cleric and it's very big so we now come upon the question of like what beast did lawrence actually become because it's kind of important uh, if you're talking about his life because i don't mean like what did he look like in an abstract sense um like the the dad from street sharks where you never see i mean like because if he is a certain beast in the game like that would tell you how his story ended because you would know where the beast was so lawrence's skull on the altar is not the skull of the quote-unquote cleric beast boss like the cleric beast boss it's clearly um a wendigo yeah, the cleric beast boss is like a wendigo. So the skull on the altar that is like unambiguously stated to be, hey, that thing there, Lawrence's skull. That's not the skull of the cleric beast boss, okay? It's the skull of a cleric beast, but it's not the skull of the boss that has the health bar that reads cleric beast. Because that boss is very very canine like like it's got this long snout it looks like a like a wolf like you, it looks like a wendigo um so it has the like it's like a, like a wolf head and it's got like these big sort of like antlers that come off the side of it as well uh whereas the skull on the altar it looks like i said like a gorilla or like a chimpanzee like it's clearly not a human skull but it doesn't look like the skull of a wolf which the cleric beast skull does and also like the cleric beast kind of has antlers the skull's got no antlers to it. it so it looks like it was a beast that was a lot more humanoid um we sort of talked about this a little bit before but like there's some beasts that just look like very hairy people so like the little the little beast patients that you see scurrying around they just kind of they kind of they could pass for like like a little monkey or something and there's also things like the the thing that's just called abhorrent beast that just looks like if the hulk was really hairy yeah yeah and like the blood starved beast when you meet that like you don't ever see it uh when it had proper skin because it's been flayed by the time you see it but it has like again like quite a flat sort of human looking face just with very long teeth and like dark beast pal when you encounter pal pal has quite a flat face as well yeah so true. yeah so the the skull on the altar is not the skull of the thing in the nightmare um at all now the thing in the nightmare is in fact in the nightmare it doesn't have to like actually look exactly like the thing that it was in the real world because you're encountering like a representation of it. Yeah, I don't think that we had a strange lava monster in the real world. Well, yeah, exactly. that's the main thing that like the Lawrence boss fight you encounter, he's literally on fire and he's vomiting lava, which now you say we didn't have a lava monster in the real world. We did that because there's the big the watchdogs in the chalice dungeons that are oh, like a dog God. that is on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. But and like, we had like the cut content fire people or something. Well, that doesn't count. <laughs> I apologize. It's Miyazaki's vision. Part of Miyazaki's vision was to allocate a whole lot of time and money to modeling creatures that he then cut from the base game, knowing and they would that was the purpose of them. They were designed to be removed from the base game to confuse you. Bravo, <laughs> Miyazaki. <laughs> He does it again. <laughs> I'm refusing to play Armored Core 6 because you didn't direct it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Logical game explainer. <laughs> All stories are one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so like, even though like fire beasts technically do exist, like the cleric beast is, is very, like it's so over the top. Like the Lawrence fight is so over the top. It, it, it It's really hard to be read as like, like he's he's literally constantly on fire, and um, 
the thing is, like, when you encounter him, the fire comes from inside of him. So it's not like he's a beast that was set on fire. Like, you encounter him, and then when he starts to wake up, like, the fire sort of starts coming out of the inside of him. Like, he's, like, he's heating up inside. Um, also, like, so much of the nightmare, like, it looks like it's bits and pieces of Yarnum, but clearly Yarnum yeah. did not look like that. Yarnum did not have a literal river of blood running through it. It's very distorted. It's literally it's like distorted, a It's distorted. Like you went, like there's like multiple copies of the same building showing up. And like you, you yeah. visit the, like the cathedral at two different points in time. You know, Maria is alive in the nightmare. But also like so. Maria's alive in the nightmare, but she's also alive as like a version of herself that, you know, like she wasn't that person when she died. Cause it mentions, yeah, like Maria throws her sword away. But then when you meet her in the nightmare, she's got the sword, sword, which she shouldn't have. And she hates the blood magic, and uh, yeah. she's, like, doing it all over the place. Yeah, yeah and, like, yeah. when you encounter, like, uh, like Mikolash, like, Mikolash is just straight up dead in the real world, but he's, yeah. like, his, his consciousness is living on in the nightmare, um, you know, and things like the the Orphan of Cos, where, like, we know that Willem, you know, had that child taken and dissected, but yeah. then in the nightmare it lives on as this sort of, like, distorted, like, monster thing that sort of embodies all the rage that it feels. Because the, the nightmare is, like, it's basically, like, an afterlife place where, like, everyone is sort of being punished for things that they did. So you can't read it, like, one-to-one. That's exactly what happened. So um, mm-hmm. there is another beast in the game that is just called the Bloodletting Beast. OMG. OMG, yeah. So um, the thing about this beast is that uh, it has a unique property, which is that the second time you meet it, it doesn't have a head. Double OMG. Almost like um, its its skull was taken somewhere else. Now, Sophie, is there a significant skull in the game? No. <laughs> Thank you. So much. Oh wait. <laughs> so the bloodletting beast, like this, is one of those things where the game never explicitly says it. It's laid on really thick that the bloodletting beast is Lawrence because it's like Lawrence disappears. We know that, like, he has some contract with the Moon Presence. Mm-hmm. When German is is in the dream, he is, like, saying, Lawrence, what's taking you so long? So, like, yeah. clearly Lawrence left with the intent of returning. And he left after making contract with the Great One. And you find this bloodletting beast boss uh, directly before Queen Yarnum. So she's he's, like, directly before, like, the the lady who is carrying another Great One child. So yeah. it's, like, to me, it's, like, very, like, obvious, like, he's trying to get to her. That was his mission. He wanted to get to her, get the child, and then come back again. And that's also ultimately what his acolyte, Mikolash, does. Like, you know, Mikolash probably didn't do it himself, but, like, the idea that Mikolash's whole thing is Mikolash and his friends, they all went down to the dungeons, and they got the child from Yarnum. So they're just copying what Lawrence did, essentially. But, um... Yeah. The thing about the the bloodletting beast is like it is very very explicit. Like there's a version of this thing that doesn't have a head. The head was removed. It's not like you find the head lying around somewhere. Like the head is just gone. And mm-hmm. the skull on the altar matches the face of the bloodletting beast right down to bloodletting beast has like a gash running down the side of its face and that lines up exactly with the gash on the skull. So putting it all together like what happens uh, after Lawrence disappears is he fa- he creates the Hunter's Dream with Flora and German, and he enters a contract with Flora. Nature of the contract, we're assuming, involves him getting another child for Flora, presumably because Flora's lost her child. She wants a replacement child. He knows that there is another child down there belonging to the Queen of Thumaru. So he goes down to find her. And he says, I will be back with the child to German, but he never makes it. And he transforms into a beast on the way, loses his humanity, loses his mind. And he just never, he never gets there. He gets to like right beforehand. And then like at some point he is encountered by the church, the church kill him and they take the skull back as a holy relic. So they must realize it's him to bother enshrining the skull. Yeah. So he may even yeah. have been with people when it happened. Yeah. Like, it's possible that, like, he transformed on the way down, and then his compatriots killed him and took the skull back. Redgrave has an interesting theory where he says that um, 
Braidor is the one who killed um, Lawrence, and that explains like it's the item possible, but the like La- Braidor, that's because Braidor wears like a cleric beast skin, but like the cleric beast skin, it's the skin of like the one with the antlers and like the gray oh, fur, that's so right. it doesn't. It can be Braidor if you then. But it's in the that- nightmare. That's true. So. <laughs> the nightmare changes fashion constantly you walk in with sneakers you live with high heels you know <laughs> the nightmare of balenciaga <laughs> the thing is like bloodborne by balenciaga would look very similar because yeah. it's already so over designed yeah. <laughs> yeah overall was lawrence's ambition a success mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to say no, but at the same time, like, Willem doesn't succeed either because, like, Lawrence is obviously, like, he's obviously wrong in what he does, but he's doing it because Willem is doing the opposite. So they're both saying my way is the correct way, and actually they're both wrong. They're both wrong in their approach, but they're also both right in their critique of the other. Willem is right when he says to Lawrence, like, you're too rash. Like, you're you're experimenting with this thing that you can't control, and it's going to end horribly for you. And he's absolutely right there. But then when Lauren says to Willem, you're so obsessed with perfection that you're never going to achieve anything because you won't let anything happen until everything is absolutely right, and we're never going to get to that spot. And that's also right because Willem never accomplishes anything. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they're both horrible people. Yeah, I think that that could probably be like its own episode. So actually, the the character that succeeds at the end of the game in doing what Lawrence and Willem were trying to do is our character. Mm -hmm. And they don't do it through this sort of like rigorous process of like research. They don't obsess over like reaching enlightenment. Um, They don't experiment on people. They reach it by basically just, like, achieving an understanding of what the Great Ones actually want. Because I'd say that, like, the problem that Lawrence and Willem both have, that neither one sees as a problem, is that they are looking at this link between parent and child, and they're looking upon it as something that is almost entirely, like, a biological or like scientific problem to be solved. What basically happens with both of them is that like they encounter this bond between parent and child and their response to that is rather than attempts to understand the bond between parent and child, they cut the parent and child apart and sort of start like measuring them and studying them to figure out where the bond actually is. And in truth, like it's just the bond between them. And the way that we ascend at the end of it is that, like, we have used these these cord items to have made that connection to all of these great ones. And in doing that, like, we've sort of achieved enlightenment rather than, like, attempting to sort of approach it as, like, you know, an analytical problem or a medical problem um, or a physical problem. But at the same time, we are only able to do that because... Lawrence and Willem butchered a bunch of babies to begin with to get us those cords. So, like, ultimately, like, a lot of what we do in Bloodborne is sort of healing this terrible thing that has happened. So the game uh, climaxes, it doesn't end, but it climaxes in two places that are both in the nightmare. And they're both scenes of, like, a mother that is reaching out for their child. And what we do in like, because it's an action game, it articulates through a boss fight. But what we're doing is we are like freeing a child who is held captive somewhere because of something that's happened to them to return to their mother. And that's ultimately what sort of heals the damage that's been done. Sophie, do the outro. Uh, Two hours, 53 minutes, 58 seconds. Subtract the current runtime of the video from, from that and you'll know how much was cut out. For reference, that was a recap. That was a recap of a character who has four lines in the entire game. Uh, That's the recap. 
and it's true that it's a recap because Sophie and I actually have other things to say about the character. There's actually a whole outline that had other stuff. There are other questions. There are other comments. But at this point, uh, we're we're very tired. At this point, we thought it was so good. <laughs> but at this point, we're very tired. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and see y'all next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hey, it's uh, Hidetake Miyazaki here. As president of From Software and creator of uh, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and the other ones, I get a lot of questions. Uh, questions like, you know, where do you get your ideas? Berserk. Where's Bloodborne 2? Up my ass. But uh, the one I hear most of all is, Hey, what's with the infanticide? This all stems from my relationship with a certain manga that was very influential on me. That manga, of course, being Akira Amino's Ketekyo Hitman Reborn. You obviously need a very high IQ to see the influence it had on me, which is why I appear on the Snack Covenant and no other channels. Back when I worked my equally thankless job at Oracle Systems, every week I'd eagerly await the new installment of Reborn, hoping that Suna and Haru would finally get together. And to this day, I still remember the rage I felt upon discovering that Suna in fact ended up with Kyoko. On that day, I declared war upon infant kind, and knew that my future lay in the games industry creating the ultimate baby-killing simulation, which would later find form in the Valley of Defilement. Should probably have mentioned uh, earlier that Reborn is about babies. A lot of people don't know that because no one remembers it. Back to this.